I think we all know why we're here. We do. It's, it's for the execution thing. of Adam Savage. No. <laughs> 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 you weren't expecting that one, were you? <laughs> remember, remember the guns in the other room? <laughs> no, no, it's true. Uh, so I'm going to let him get started. And uh, a should. man that really needs no introduction. Round of applause. Thank you. That was great. How you guys doing? Nice. I just read a tweet of someone that said, people are idiots for waiting half, wasting half a day of DEF CON to see. Don't try this. <laughs> I want to see, an, I want to actually try a quick experiment. I'd like only the people in the overflow room to yell for a second. Can we go one, two, three, yell? I can't hear him. <laughs> There's no one in there. Awesome. You're all here then. Excellent. All right. So I was going to start with a, a, a talk that I've been working on about failure. And then I realized I'm also actually talking to the crowd that understands more about failure than actually I know, I'm quite sure. I mean, you guys, your whole hobby, no, excuse me, your whole hobby is about inducing and exploring failures of systems, right? I'm not talking about you as failures. Jesus, you think I'd open with that? <laughs> failure has made me who I am today. And I want to talk a little bit about how that works. Um, when I was 10 years old, I got into magic like every 10-year-old. And I got so into it, I ended up doing a magic show for my fifth grade class. Is that how old you are in 10? Yeah, my fifth grade class. And I got a standing ovation from like 300 students. And it was phenomenal and intoxicating. The next year, I put together a really great, great performance. And then I think it was, I think his name was David Sachs. David Sachs was my volunteer to come up on stage and I would cuff him in these chains behind his back and he wouldn't be able to get out of them. And then I would demonstrate that I could get out of them, except that David got out of them. <laughs> which really kind of killed the whole flow of my performance. Um, and because I was not prepared for this, I actually, I got really upset. I was 10. So after the performance, I was kind of, you know, weepy and upset about it and he came over and what well, sorry my teacher miss levine was like what's the matter and i was like david Sachs ruined my magic show and david Sachs walks by and the teacher says what did you do to him and david Sachs is like i didn't do anything and i then called him a, i think i called him a fat shit <laughs> and that's when he punched me in the face and knocked me down <laughs> david i'm sorry um, in 2000, 1999, I went from working for years in the commercial industry to working for Industrial Light and Magic. And it really was like graduating and going to heaven. It was exactly the thing that I had pictured it was since I was 12 years old, working for some of my heroes, working on building spaceships, for Christ's sakes. And one of the offshoots of doing that, when you work in special effects, there are no actual jobs. You actually are constantly freelancing. You're constantly picking up work. Even if you're working full time during the day, you're often doing night work for other people, department stores, whoever will pay you to build things because you've got to pay next month's rent. And one of the side effects of working in Industrial Light and Magic is all of a sudden, the fact that you can say you work in Industrial Light and Magic means that no one wants to see your resume anymore. They all think that that's enough. That means that you know what you're doing. And all of a sudden, work starts coming from all over the place because it's a bigger pool of people who are doing their own G-jobs and side jobs. At ILM, we called them G-jobs, which is, stood for either government work or gravy work or both. Um, and because, you were getting, because I started getting all this great freelance work, I was enjoying a, an income about twice as big as I'd been making in the commercial industry. And I got this call from my friend Ben, and he said, uh, there's this job that everyone in San Francisco has turned down right now. It's... Uh, because there's not enough time. This big department store wants to have window displays going up for the new San Francisco ballpark for opening day. They want six weeks of these window displays. They want baseballs to pitch over the fences in these, in these window displays. And I thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a mechanical guy. I've done pneumatics work. I've done some middling electronics and stuff. I, sure, I think I could do it. When you're bidding a job like this, you obviously want to bid what the market will bear. And the fact that a big department store wants this window display in 
five days. This is a Monday. They need it installed on Saturday morning. Um, means that you can charge double. Except that when I did my day rate and worked out how long it would take me to do it and I, and I doubled it, it still didn't look high enough. Because you can sometimes smell the right figure. And I knew that there also was this, well, the, the new uh, Pismo laptop had just come out. <laughs> and it turned out to be just the right amount to add on to this bid. <laughs> so I have my priorities in order. So I, uh, I gave them this bid. It was very, very, it was the most I'd ever charged for a, for a job like this. And uh, I started doing, the, started doing the job. We picked up some pitching machines, picked up some adjustable relays at Granger, and started working out a system for reciprocating the, these baseballs and bringing them back in. Um, and what I didn't, <laughs> this story is going to be quite quick. What happens is, is that I didn't realize the movement of spheres through space is actually quite complex when you're moving them slowly. When you're moving them fast, they actually behave in a very uh, uh, repeatable and predictable fashion, but when you're moving light spheres through through air slowly, they can you can get these vagaries that make them very hard to predict where they're going to go. Even if you have a really big you know, a really big thing to catch them. Um, and I noticed that I was getting about a hundred balls to pitch over the fence at a time, and then one would fail. And I did the math, and I realized that meant that they'd fail about every eight minutes for six weeks. And I didn't have that many baseballs, so I started to try and work out solutions, and it culminated in me staying up for, and I just kept on seeing this money, right? Like this laptop was going to be there at the end of the week, so I just kept on sort of barreling towards it. And I didn't sleep Thursday night, and I didn't sleep Friday night, and Saturday morning, I, you remember how Home Depot, whenever they open somewhere, they open 24 hours a day until they've shut down a certain amount of local hardware stores, and then they cut back to banker's hours? So this was early in their tenure in San Francisco. There was, I was there at like 2 in the morning. I was there at 4. I bought a router at 2 in the morning just because where else can you do that? <laughs> I didn't need a router. <laughs> um, so I showed up on Saturday morning without any sleep, figuring that I was going to be able to make this work. And I, I was kind of buying my own hype. I was saying, I work at ILM. I ought to be able to make this work. I've, been, I've done, com I've done eight, 500 commercials. This, is, this, is, this will just work. And after 13 hours of trying to install this thing, where I discovered that they had actually made the stage I was reciprocating the returning baseballs under smaller and the backboard also narrower so that all of my tolerances became a little bit tighter, um, everything was going far worse in the windows than it had been going in my shop. I would have begged for a 1 in 100 failure rate in the windows, but I was more getting like 1 in 10. And about 6, 6.30, this... I think teenager who was in charge of this job, she was like 20, she said, how's it going? And I said, it's not gonna work. I've never said that to a client before. And she said, what? She'd never heard that from a vendor before. <laughs> and I said, uh, this mechanically is not going to work. These balls are just going to fail. It's gonna run for five minutes and then there won't be any balls pitching over the fence. And she said, well, what are you gonna do about it? And I thought a lot about this, I thought, you know, I'm earning some of this money. You still see the laptop in the future. I'm earning some of this money. I'm probably willing to refund them half. I'm probably, well, just right away half. I mean, this job is, everyone turned it down. I still want to get paid for some of my time. And I'm ready to do this. But the first thing I say is, look, let's try and salvage this. I'll come up with two solutions in the next 10 minutes. And if you choose one of them, if you like it, I will implement it by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. I should also point out, this is 6.30 p.m. At that very moment, my mom and my sister were arriving at San Francisco Airport to spend the weekend with me and my wife and our new six-month-old twins, who I hadn't seen in three days because I'd been working on this job. Um, I figured at this point I'd be driving to the airport to pick up my mom, but I wasn't. I was now agreeing to stay up for another night and again, I was at Home Depot at 2, 4, and 6 a.m. doing this, basically stringing these baseballs on a, on, a, on a monofilament and running them up and over the fence. And they said, uh, yes, okay, no, we'll go for that. Again, I'm still figuring that at the end of this, she's going to say, you owe us some money back. And I'm, you know, if I implement Plan B successfully, uh, I'll, I'll just wipe a third of this. And I spent all day Saturday installing, installing this thing. And at the end of the day... Um, 
the, the, the head of, the VP of visuals comes in from out of town. He takes a look at the windows. He walks up and down. That's great. That's great. It looks great. Those baseballs on the monofilament, they look like crap. Get them out of there. <laughs> um, I told that story to a colleague at, uh, at ILM later on, and he said, <laughs> man, I've never screwed up a job that bad. <laughs> and I thought, really? Really? I mean... I, that makes me not trust you so much. I mean, I told this with the benefit of hindsight. It was about a year and a half, two years later. And I realized how important that experience was to me. I, I, people who have failed, people who don't think that they've failed, I don't like working with them. They're, they're going to they're gonna push me under the bus at some point. Um, in 1986, I had uh, pretended to attend NYU for about six months. Uh, and then dropped out. It was kind of a family chip on the shoulder problem with authority that I had. And, uh, but I had made several of the friends I still have as my dearest friends in the world there, and they were all attending NYU Film School. And so, living in New York at the time for about four more years, I got a kind of ersatz New York University Film School education by working on all of their films. And the first and biggest one was for my friend David Worla. Um, and he was doing this super, super ambitious senior thesis film called Gargoyle and Goblin, a full-on fantasy, 30-minute fantasy film taking place in New York, shot in all the abandoned male porn theaters in Midtown. <laughs> Why did we have access to them? Because David's grandmother owned them all. <laughs> he said getting to Thanksgiving dinner was an adventure. Uh, she lived above one, right? He had to go through the lobby. Anyway, we're working on Gargoyle and Goblin, and David and I, we had talked about it for months. I knew it was coming, and he asked me to art direct it, and I did. And actually, I art directed it with, uh, with a couple of people who've since gone on to become really, really amazing Hollywood art directors. And it was the first time I'd ever done anything on that kind of scale. And I, 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 it really worked out well. It was an incredibly consolidated crew, 16 people shooting nights for two weeks, living in this block of abandoned buildings where we were filming, constantly blowing out the power of one building, tapping into the one next door to it until we blew out power to that one, um, getting incredible footage in the can, pneumatic wings on, these, on this gargoyle and all this stuff going on. And it ended up winning Best Art Direction at the NYU Film, Film Festival, NYU Film School Film Festival that year. And I thought, this might be really a viable occupation for me. Uh, this, this is a... You know, I thought I wanted to be an actor. Before that, I thought I wanted to be a juggler, a magician, a designer for Lego. There were all these things that I had <laughs> desired to do, but I thought the art direction really might be it. And so I started to, you know, throw my name out to friends. If you want me to art direct your film, you know, I, I, could, I could do it. And my friend Gabby called me up and asked me to do this film that she was producing. She was experimenting with being a producer. And uh, she was working on this film called Ten Key Trauma, which is about a guy with a bad toupee who goes to an ATM, and the ATM makes fun of his toupee. And they needed, uh, uh, they needed one of those ATM enclosures that are all over New York, the door you have to put your card in to get into this little 8 by 10 foot cell with an ATM in it. And they needed that whole thing, and they needed control over it, and they couldn't get the location, so they asked me to build it. And they had this huge budget, $800. <laughs> and I, I started working on it. I had never built flats before. Uh, I had never really built any kind of uh, 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 technical prop like a, like a banking machine. But again, I, I, I'd been building things since I was five years old. I, you know, cardboard, I built anything out of cardboard. I felt like I had the chops to do this. And so I started to drag materials out to this distant remote location in Brooklyn at my friend Dave Mesobov's house um, and building this set. First thing we needed was a floor. Dave had wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpeting, but you know, those, those self-stick vinyl tiles. I stuck one down, I jumped on it for a second and I peeled it back up. It didn't leave any sticky stuff on the carpet. It seemed like it was gonna be fine. <laughs> um, I had never built flats before, but I had seen them building flats when I was in all the dr plays in the drama club in high school. So I got some one by three wood and I made some triangular braces and I stretched some canvas over it. And those guys said, well, we've got some guys that can paint this. And I said, that's great. And so I went off to work on the bank machine. And over about a month, I kept on assembling, I assembled more and more parts to this. And Again, we came down to this like Wednesday afternoon when I realized that the crew was all going to show up on Saturday morning and I didn't have nearly as much ready as I was hoping to have. 
I, the bank machine was failing miserably. I'd been down to Canal Street. Remember Canal Street back in like the 80s? Yeah. Oh, God, it was heaven. Uh, I was down there at the, all the different surplus places buying pieces of hardware to make a viable bank machine and pieces were cracking on me. I was painting things. The paint was crazing on me. I was hitting all the disasters that you hit within the special effects industry except um, similar to the, the first story, I wasn't asking for anybody's help. I thought I could, this is totally within my skill set. I could just do this. And again, from Wednesday to Saturday, I did not sleep. Saturday morning, I'd been in the location all night long. Oh, by the way, I, I showed up on location to discover that um, those tiles don't like to stay together on wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. So the floor looked like crap. And then the, the paint that they put on the canvas on my flats was making the canvas wrinkle because I didn't know about the substrate you're supposed to put on canvas flats before you paint them. Um, and the bank machine wasn't fitting in because I had gotten a couple of dimensions wrong. And I'm just, I'm running around, running around, running around, basically attempting to run around enough so no one can say I'm not actually trying. But I'm also, I'm, I'm 60 hours without sleep. I'm completely, completely spent. And at one point, the, one of the crew members stops me and puts his hand on my shoulder and says, do you know what, do you know what you're doing? Do you even know what you're doing? And I, I really seriously thought, <laughs> this is the delusion of grandeur at the time. I thought, I'll just say what Indiana Jones would say. <laughs> I don't know, I'm making this up as I go along. And he didn't think it was funny. <laughs> it just whoosh, right over his head. And he put his other hand on my other shoulder and said, go home. We don't need you here anymore. And I went home and I felt pretty bad. I felt really bad. I felt, um, I felt so bad I didn't show up for the loadout two and a half days later. Um, I had heard that the crew pulled two all-nighters trying to film around my crappy set. At the moment they were doing the loadout, I was all the way across town having sex. <laughs> and they found out. <laughs> it's the, one of the downsides of working in small clusters of friends. Um, at any rate, I went on that Monday to go pick up my toolkit. And uh, the toolkit was this kind of this point of obsession with me. During the process of making this, of, of working on this film, I had I'd found this leather like sample case uh, on the street in New York. You find everything on the street in New York, and I had filled it full of tools. It was the first toolkit that I made that was first order retrievability, which is it meant I didn't have to move any tool out of the way to get to any other tool, and I was really quite proud of it. And I got there, and there was literally like a taped outline on the floor where my toolkit was, and a note saying, "We have your tools. Call Gabby." Gabby, no, this is a close-knit circle of 18, 19-year-old kids in New York, you know. There's a, there's a closeness you get with the people at that age that is never equaled by anybody else for the rest of your lives. And this, 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 these were my friends. Gabby was one of them. And I called Gabby from the location, and she just started, she started in and said, what, what did you do to me? I trusted you. I trusted you to do this. And I told these guys, you could, the director of this film worked in a 7-Eleven for five months living with his parents to save up the money for this film. And as far as we can see, you pissed it all away and none of it showed up on camera. If, if you could have done, she said, if you could have done anything to convince me that you are not worth being friends with, you have done it. Now get over here with every goddamn receipt that you have because I want to see every penny that you spent. And I, uh, I, uh, I called my dad. I, I called my dad, and I was like, I, I was weeping. I felt like I felt like shit on your shoe. I felt worse than I've ever felt in my whole life. I've felt worse than that since then, I think. But at that point, that was the, <laughs> that was the worst. And I, he said, "There's nothing you can do." He said, "You have to." I, he said, "There's nothing you can do. You can move on from here." One of the most phenomenal pieces of advice I've ever gotten. Um, and I went to Gabby's, I went to Gabby's dorm room and I somehow actually, through some kind of bistromathics, accounted for every penny in the budget. And then when we were finished, it took about an hour, during which we didn't speak about anything but the budget. I mean, this was now an ex-friend of mine I was doing this with. Um, she said, the crew is next door and they want to talk to you. And now I'm starting to think, they're going to kick the crap out of me. <laughs> and actually, it, the way I feel, 
that would be that would be appropriate. Like I feel like that would be an appropriate response to the circumstances, and I would actually feel like it would be a release. Like I'd get to pay for my sins. I'm thinking it's like Animal House, right? I'm going to open the door, and then someone's going to pop me across the kiss room, and they're going to kick me for a while and throw me out. Um, so I open the door, and instead what I see is a dark room with the entire crew, like 22 guys, all around the perimeter of the room, and there's a chair in the middle of the room and a spotlight on the chair. <laughs> I'm, not ki- I'm not exaggerating at all, and the first thought through my head, things st- literally on the graph of like feeling like crap, it just blipped up a little bit, and I thought, at least now it makes a good story. <laughs> I sat right down on the chair. One of them commented later, like, he sat down on the chair, like, immediately. I'm like, well, I know what my role is. <laughs> I sat down on the chair, and the director sat and read out a list of about 100 things that I had said that I would do that I did not achieve in the course of screwing up his senior film, senior thesis film. And he didn't miss a trick. I mean, he had everything down. And at the end of this, which took about 25 minutes, oh, by the way, each, each time he'd get to something really interesting, a member of the crew might pop in and go, yeah, man, that really pissed me off little peanut gallery comments from around. I can't see anybody. I'm just a spotlight on my face. And um, at the end, he says, do you want to, do you have anything to say? And I said, no, I, I really don't. I'm, I, I cannot tell you how bad I feel, how responsible I feel. Uh, you're 100% right. You haven't missed a trick. I take responsibility for everything. I recognize that means nothing. I'm sorry that my apology means nothing. I'm sorry on like five different meta levels of sorry. And I know that all of them don't mean anything to you, and I'm sorry for that too. <laughs> and he's, <laughs> he says, <laughs> there's this long pause after I said that. I don't think I was quite as funny. And he says, we're not trying to bring you down, man. <laughs> It's, I had a therapist point out years later, like, I grew up with this, my dad was kind of crazy. And, you know, when my, dad had a, when my dad would get pissed off, you did not want to get in his way. And I am a master at not getting in somebody who's pissed off's way. I am the reed that bends. <laughs> and these guys were no match for my ability. Their anger was nothing compared to my dad's. Ah, woo, it's just not, whoosh, went right by Terrible positive reinforcement for my skill set. <laughs> so what did this do for me, though? This, this informed me that I was totally fallible, that I need to ask for help, that I could fail and move on, that, that these are really important things. I, I, every parent will tell you that every parent will tell you that you make a rule for your kid and he'll break it. You put a wall up and he'll push against it. And there's a prevailing theory, I don't know whose it is, that this is how a child learns the shape of the world. And if you don't give them any boundaries, they start freaking out. We all know children who don't get any boundaries. They start freaking out because the world feels unsafe to them. They need someone to tell them what the limit is. And I think that failure in my life has worked in the exact same way. It doesn't teach me the limit of the world, but it teaches me the shape of my intuition. And if there's one thing I've learned as the dilettante journeyman polymath that I, you know, aspired to be my whole life. It's that a craftsman isn't somebody who doesn't make mistakes. There's somebody who can smell the mistakes happening before you, t- before you do, and they can stop them happening in their tracks. It's not about the cessation of failure. It's about recognizing that it's occurring, recognizing that it's going to be an inherent part of the process, and recognizing that you've got to dance with it. And if sometimes it's going to catch up with you. Sometimes you're going to screw things up so badly and it's going to be fine in the end. I, I've worked at places where they're so failure averse. If a supervisor is messing up a job, other people will start to show up to help them finish the job. But no one talks to the supervisor and tells them that they're screwing up. He's just all of a sudden the crew's gotten a little bigger. And consequently, you end up with people who've, you know, worked in these companies for 20 years. They don't realize that they've been screwing things up all the time because no one's telling them. I don't trust people that haven't failed. There's a, um, there's a, a, a Raymond Chandler quote about his hero. There's a pheno- he wrote a phenomenal essay about his hero, Philip Marlowe, uh, called The Simple Art of Murder. And if you haven't read it, I would read it. It is, along with Self-Reliance by Ralph Waldo Emerson, probably one of the single most important pieces of writing to me as far as what it means to um, 
be a person of honor in the world. And at the end of this, he says, he gives all these great qualities about his hero, his range of awareness, his, 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 self of sen his sense of pride, his, uh, his, his ethic system. And in the end, he says, if the world were full of people like him, it would be a very safe place to live without being too boring to be worth living in. And that's what I aspire to. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm opening the floor to questions for a good, what, 40 minutes or so? Yeah, awesome. And um, anyone want to take bets on whether RFID is the first, second, or third question I get? Well, we can deal with that right away. <laughs> but before we deal with that, I have a question. Because yeah. I remember seeing this talk. And, uh, did you ever mend friendships with that per the, the person that audited you? Um, Gabby, uh, yeah, actually, Gabby and her husband came out to San Francisco about, about a year ago. And uh, she and her, they, they, they and their kids and me and my kids had a lovely lunch together. And... You know, after 20 years, it really is water under the bridge, but uh, I have rarely had a thing with friends go so sour. Thank you. Now for this RFID thing. <laughs> Render. All right. Do I seem familiar to you at all? Yes. <laughs> How badly do you want to punch me in the face? <laughs> no, that's fine. Look, honestly, I'm going to finish the RFID thing just by saying the truth is more boring than you think. If you go and read all the press accounts, I will tell you that the, uh, the companies that were in on that phone call, the Texas Instruments phone call that I spoke so famously about, they, their account of that phone call is factually entirely correct. Um, and that's all I'm going to say on the subject. <laughs> I just wanted to apologize. I did oh. not mean to cause you any grief. <laughs> that's fine. And if you want it, you can have a copy of my book. Excellent. There I'll take it. Is, it. is it signed? <laughs> awesome. So let's do some Q&A. Who's first? Well, you got to stand up and come here. This, this is not a magical stretchy mic. So I think what all of DEF CON wants to know is just how much taller is Jamie than you? <laughs> He's tiny. <laughs> Jamie's got like, his feet are like this big. I think it's from his time as a geisha in the 18th century. <laughs> and he's like, he's like 5'4". He walks on apple boxes all the time. Can you tell us about a myth that will never make it to the air that you've researched? We, we... <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, 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 how far do I go? There's only been a couple. A lot of people ask about the spectacular things that Discovery One allows us to do. And honestly, if you've seen my talks, I say this repeatedly. The truth is that the things they don't let us do are often the things they think are too boring. Um, coat hanger against high-end speaker cable. Um, all that kind of stuff, right? They still, won't let, they still don't think my, my high-fidelity episode is worth running. Um, but uh, we did explore... I'm just going to say we explored a myth involving lots and lots of liquid oxygen. Oh. And in my time on Mythbusters, working with all the different explosives, there's nothing that frightens me more than, than, than flammable gases, except that flammable gases are a cakewalk compared to liquid oxygen. It is terrifying, and when you start really going into the, into the material that we read and did a little bit of experimenting with, Totally unpredictable. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it's just, it's terrifying stuff, and we've just abandoned that story because it it's involves working with too much liquid oxygen under too uh, hard to reproduce cir circumstances from too far away, and so we're just not going to go there. I'm not going to tell you the myth. Uh, speaking of failure, what's the most epic failure you ever had on Mythbusters? On Mythbusters, um, we were doing 22,000-foot fall. <laughs> I know this instantly. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's been a lot. We had one recently where Jamie left the emergency brake on a car that had to drive. But um, it's actually really funny because it, it, uh, you could see him. 
he's alone on this on this hilltop and there's cameras on him and we're away you know looking at what's happening and if you watch the camera footage like this uncut five minute take of Jamie watching have their cars gone and he's wondering why it went the way it w went and then you can watch the penny drop in his eyes <laughs> it's just like oh crap um, no, we were on 22,000 foot fall. We had a, this is a myth about a, 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 a paratrooper falling out of a bomber uh, into a train station glass roof as it was exploding. And supposedly the blast pressure cushioned him total hogwash. But we, um, we had a weather balloon holding Buster up 450 feet above this fake train station roof we'd made. And the wind was blowing it off in the wrong direction. And well, we had to get the hip buster up to the top of this with a quick release, and it involved, was that we're also shooting up an Angels camp uh, north of San Francisco on, during the California heat wave of about four years ago, where it was 118 degrees in the shade. We actually had to stop working at 10 or 11 a.m. because the fire department was going to shut us down because the fire hazard was too high after that. So we're getting on set at 3 in the morning and working by car headlights until dawn when we're, you know, go to set up Buster on the balloon, we're gonna rise him up. And whenever you're taking a system off a tie off and releasing it into something else, there's this transition moment. And I hadn't thought through the transition moment. I had, uh, I had this like extra length of about a foot of rope between where Buster was tied off the weather balloons were about to take him up and I had five people on guy wires ready to release him and I cut this I cut this tying, tying wire and the force of him going up gave rope burns to all five people holding guy wires and everything went pear-shaped I mean the whole you know Buster starts to float away we're running after him worse than that it's Friday we're supposed to be finishing this we're supposed this neck what happens next is that we're done working for a week in 118 degrees and I know instantly that we'll be back at 3 a.m. the next morning to do it again and yeah it was awful it was the worst the worst screw up I've ever had I consoled myself with the fact that they don't really on a big scale happened that often and we you know we hit we were able to accommodate it um, hello uh, and my heart is par uh, pounding here so <laughs> please excuse me um, but I, I, do, I do want to say uh, first one very quick comment which is that I do uh, actually suffer from social anxiety a lot and so actually hearing that fi the the failure talk is very helpful uh, my, my, qu my, my question is actually about uh, uh, the, the the Apollo mission, uh, which is that was a wonderful episode. I was just wondering what you would have liked to have done additional that you weren't able to do, just because I've, I actually had to share the, the, the shared that video uh, with some coworkers to actually prove to them, you know, we actually did go to the moon. <laughs> but uh, uh, so uh, it, yeah, just any, a, anything. It would be great. I, I've. I really like your show. Well, we, we love that episode. That episode was what we sent out as, a, as an example of our best work last year to the Emmy nominating committee, and it's one of the reasons we got nominated for an Emmy for the first time this year. Um, thank you. Um, there's plenty of material in the Apollo moon landing. I mean, we have a whole other hour's worth of material we could do. We, we chose the stuff that we were most interested in. Um, and uh, it doesn't seem to have convinced anybody who needed convincing, unfortunately. The need for a good conspiracy theory, I think, is too hard to shake. The need to, I, I think it's a deep-seated need for just to find out that someone's in charge. <laughs> Scariest thing is that no one's in charge. Yes. Except the systems administrators. <laughs> hey, Adam. Just despite all the failure that you've decided to share, um, hypothetically, if zombies were to attack, <laughs> could I live in your basement? <laughs> could you what? Could I live with you in your basement? Just like, you know, I'll be, take up a corner. I'm not sure I'd let you in. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be under a shoot first, ask questions later kind of mood. All right, thanks. <laughs> By the way, if zombies did attack, my favorite weapon would be the lawnmower, but that's just because I'm deeply in love with uh, that Peter Jackson film, Dead Alive. Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon uh, Mr. Savage. How are you? Very good. You're a very attractive man. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> a little closer like that? Yeah, directly. Okay. Filet the mic. Filet the mic. So, uh, um, so the, the one guy hit on a question I had. 
Are you currently working, on, uh, working for the government um, on staging a manned mission to Mars type of thing, you know, framing that? <laughs> <laughs> the community's been asking, and I just, and secondly, where do you buy your cod pieces? Where do I buy my what? Cod pieces. Cod pieces? No, this is real, mate. <laughs> Uh, no, we're not working for the government helping them fake anything. You think they'd turn to us? I know much more qualified people than me to do that. So two questions on failure for, for you. Uh, one for me, one for you. One, have you recast your uh, Falcon yet down to the appropriate size? Um, and uh, two, um, as a big fan of the show, I, I really want a replica of the Mythbusters sign. How does the Mythbusters team make it? Um, we, uh, it's a plasma cutter in about 30 minutes. Uh, honestly, we just, we, we draw out the letters. Uh, I think the last one, we had a producer leave the show and he took one with him. So I had to remake it about three years ago. Um, I made the, no, I think Jamie made the original one. I made the second one. Uh, we just cut out the letters and then, uh, weld them all the way around to another sign. I don't have a plasma cutter. Can I get you to make me one? <laughs> <laughs> it would be pretty expensive. I have to admit. Um, as for the Maltese Falcon, uh, earlier this year, I actually got to spend some time having an audience with a real Maltese Falcon. And I was able to take a couple of hundred photographs of it. Um, I it was last minute access. I didn't have a ruler, so I did the old prop maker's trick of putting a dollar bill next to it. I have a ton of reference material. So I'm actually planning to re-sculpt the entire thing from scratch the next time I get a free weekend. And I'm not sure when that's going to be. But uh, no, it's, that's an ongoing saga. Thank you. You, sir, are a giant nerd. <laughs> I mean that in the best way. Hi, um, I'm Syntax. I'm hosting the, Geo, the uh, <laughs> DEF CON Geo Challenge. I'm the one that originally emailed you to get you out here. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to thank you personally for coming out here. And the prize is that... <laughs> Did you like the, the prizes that I found for you? We got the prizes. Or on di one set of them is on display over at our booth in the contest area. That's great. And uh, there's been a lot of excitement. It was a first year event. It's really drawn a lot of attention to it. So I'd like to thank you for coming and for the prizes that you donated for our event. My pleasure. I, my first question in his email was like, yeah, sure, I'll give you some prizes. But do you think you could let, get me in to speak at DEF CON? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've noticed that uh, there's often a difference between uh, when you're confirming or busting a myth that sometimes, sorry, sometimes <laughs> you uh, confirm or deny the myth based on the spirit of the myth and sometimes it's based on the letter of the myth. Is there any reason for that difference? No, it is. It's as we feel it, honestly. It, um, it just bugs me. No, you're absolutely right. It comes up just like that where we'll often get to the end of a bunch of experimentation and Jamie and I and the producer will have three different ideas about how to call it. Um, we've even sent a blueprint to the editor saying, well, this one's busted. And the editor sent back, <laughs> sent back word going, I've watched the cut and here are the reasons I actually don't think it's busted. And we're like, wow, you're totally right. All right, let's call it plausible. Um, <laughs> it's... It, it's like science, man. It's, it's open to interpretation, often, the results. And, I mean, we play it as we feel it. And if we got it wrong, we'll go back and revisit it. That's one of my favorite parts of the job. Well, obviously, the uh, rocket car was one of your very first myths. Yeah. And then you tried it again, and it didn't go so well. Do you have plans to uh, give it another shot? Because um, that would be fantastic. Yeah, no, rocket car 3.0 is on the list. The... It, and even though we built that ramp in two days for a total of about five grand, um, it is, was one of the most expensive episodes we've ever filmed. I think it cost us somewhere close to 100 grand to, to get the whole crew to the desert and get that whole thing set up. The two guys who built, two guys with the company that built that rocket, and guys who we interviewed on, on the show who asked for their titles to be changed from rocket makers to rocket experts. Uh, they have actually graciously uh, offered two rockets for free. 
which is a great big savings. When I said I think someone owes me 10,000 bucks, actually each of those rockets was 10,000 bucks. So uh, it's $20,000 worth of rocket power. Uh, at a certain point, I think we will see Rocket Car 3.0. You know what they say about three on a match. <laughs> Uh, there was a Mythbusters episode where uh, the uh, helpers did the Iraqi batteries. Uh, I remember that you got electrocuted a little bit, and they, oh yeah, you you got a little uh, <laughs> you got a little uh, shocked. I was kind of wondering, were you really that pissed, or or were you just kind of BSing it for the camera? No, no, no. I I was so pissed, and actually my whole crew was so pissed. It's my wife saw the episode after about six months. I mean, I came home that day and told her about it. She was really pissed off. It wasn't actually Cary Grant or Scotty that had initiated that. It was, the, it was our producer at the time. And uh, <laughs> at the time, I, I, so I, I told my wife about it. When she saw the episode, she said, it actually doesn't come across as bad as you made it sound when you came home. And I said, well, that's because actually my crew refused to go outside and film me during the 10 minutes I was calming down because I was so enraged. It's 100,000 volts. I mean, even though it's for, you know, two milliseconds, it was right through the center of my heart. Um, and it initiated what was kind of an unspoken agreement, which is a prank detente among the Mythbusters crew, specifically Jamie and I, uh, which is because when it, comes to, when it comes to pranking, we're kind of, I think, like nuclear powers. And it's, it's like a mutually assured, it's like, you know, I, I you know, get you with an electric buzzer and I come home and my house is full of water. <laughs> it's that kind of like, boom, boom. And Jamie, you know, he fights dirty and I don't want to get into that. Um, it came into, actually, the other thing that initiated the prank detente was that uh, I fall asleep everywhere I go. Any moving vehicle, I fall asleep instantly. And uh, I snore really loudly. It drives Jamie nuts. And so... I drive myself to locations now, but we used to all go in a crew van and I'd be in the way back like <laughs> And Jamie would like occasionally take a little bit of water from his bottle and he'd pour it on my crotch. <laughs> you know, it's like actually your jeans make this kind of natural little pocket. He'd just work a few grams at a time. And this one time he managed to get a whole bottle <laughs> while I was sleeping and I was having the weirdest dream. <laughs> I'm and sure I, you. I woke up, and you know how sometimes you wake up, but something's happening, and you know exactly what's happening? I knew exactly what's happening, and literally before I'd even opened my eyes, I'd smacked him in the back of the head <laughs> and said, do you really want to go here, man? Because I'll, I'll spend weeks planning something that's funny to everyone but you. <laughs> that will be my goal. And he was like, Jamie did this. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I'll never do it again. <laughs> so, speaking of Monsieur Walrus Face, um, uh, I got a quick question. You having a good time here? Very, very good. I love, I love talking to engineers. I love talking to the, the geeks. How many? I usually ask how many people have yelled at their television at me, but. How many yes. of you have actually called me an idiot to your television? <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, I can hear it. <laughs> so, uh, what are you doing next year around this time? Uh, I'll come right on back. What about the rest of the crew? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're having a good time. We're having a good time. You got friends. We got friends. I'll see if I can bring some... I don't know if I can get Jamie to come out, but... Well, come on. We love Jamie. It's, he's very antisocial. Oh, he's antisocial? He's not. He's not antisocial. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll bring Grant next year. I promise. Wait, he says... <laughs> you think she's going to come for an invite like that? <laughs> so so um, one of our red shirts made a... Red shirts made a, um, a note that Jamie does have to sleep occasionally, and we have some very able bodies. <laughs> but he sleeps in a locked cryonic chamber, so. Let me introduce you to Deviant. <laughs> so, Adam, you've blown stuff up a couple of times at my school in New Mexico now, and I just wanted to ask, 
even though I've already heard it from Carrie and Grant, what theirs was. What's your favorite explosion? My favorite explosion? Um, that, so I'll tell you the story about at New Mexico Tech letting that rocket car go off. Um, you'll see, if you watch the episode again, you'll see the light glow across my eyes and you see this like pure joy reaction on my face and then you see me do something funny with my mouth it's because I'm actually drooling <laughs> I drooled on camera and tried to cover it up and be like that was great <laughs> um, it's better if I had the footage but watch the episode again you can tell your friends he's drooling um, my favorite explosions are, honestly are actually not technically explosions it's watching hot water heaters fail that, I hope you never experience it firsthand without proper planning, but, you I know. I thought I, I wasn't supposed to do that at home. <laughs> this, this is, Jamie and I talk about, like, at this point, after, you know, 800 some odd set up explosions, um, they're like wines to us. We're like, oh, that had a sharp snap with a nice deep rumble at the tail end. <laughs> I'm still feeling it. Um, and, you know, C4's got its crack, and the Ampho's got its thud, and the, the hot water heaters are just, like, guttural and phenomenal. I can't get enough of the hot water heaters. There's, so we did the hot water heater up through the roof of your house a couple of years ago, and people kept writing to us and said, uh, you know, my house is two stories, and my hot water heater's in the basement. So coming up in October, during the new set of premieres we have coming up, um, we actually did a hot water heater, and we, we set, set it loose in a two-story house that we built. And it's pretty cool. <laughs> hey there. Uh, so normally in the TV show, you have a narrator. And the narrator tends to you know, cast Jamie as kind of like the you know, well-thinking, thoughtful guy, and you as kind of the goofball guy. Uh, so first off, do you have any say over what they say? And if not, have you ever had any conflicts over what they've sort of put over, you know, put over the episode? Um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to, no, the show gets written in Australia. Uh, we drive how, what we shoot. So we have, a, we have an idea about how this narrative is playing out. And we shoot, after all these years, at a fairly low ratio for reality television. Um, reality television. Um, so that when we get a rough cut, we're pretty clear about what it was going to look like. The, the writers and producers who cut the show in Australia, uh, we have a very good relationship with them. So I've never been really unhappy with something they've written in. They do sometimes play around with the conflict which is still quite genuine. I mean, the, the, the dislike you see between uh, Jamie and I and our methodology sometimes oh, is absolutely there. Kind of busy right now. Um, there was a time actually early on in the show where I did end up having this concern that uh, well, I had this fan write to me and said, I really like your show, Mistbusters. Actually, it's more like Jamie's show and you're his perky assistant. <laughs> and I'm giving that guy that voice because, you know, that... <laughs> I'm editorializing. Um, and I, I actually was like, is this how people are perceiving this show? Because really, it is, the fundament is our interest level and our ideas and what we're doing. And it is an absolute partnership in every sense of the word. And the most important uh, professional partnership that I'll probably ever have. And it's with a guy who drives me nuts. It's with a guy who I have the deepest respect for. Um, and... Uh, that makes a big difference because it allows you to realize that you know this product is bigger than the sum of its parts. You recognize that people love the show for what it is, and they you know what you see really is kind of what you get. Um, and uh, you know we do fudge around sometimes. There was a point in which Jamie caught a terrible flu. Uh, yeah, he caught a terrible flu when we were shooting the ninja ep one part of the ninja episode, the walking on water. And so we ended up shooting that whole sequence around him not being there with insert shots for him to come in so that when he came back in, we could make a maximum use of him, even down to it being his idea. Um, because within the context of the episode, we make sure that we trade off so that, you know, one of us is doing this, one of us is doing that. We really want, you know, there to be a balance between stuff. And so there are sometimes things that are, that are my ideas on camera that were his idea in real life and vice versa. Uh, it's a very spongy process. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Great talk. 
my question's in two parts, and they definitely are related. One, within your entire, within your entire time during, uh, during Mythbusters, have you ever gone through a myth that has really challenged uh, or opposed something that you truly believed or felt within yourself, say, hey, this can't possibly happen because of I know of X, Y, and Z, or I believe X, Y, and Z, and th this thing happened. Has that ever, have you ever had something like that, and can you explain that? Also, if this has ever happened to you, uh, do you somehow see that as a maybe a, a shortcoming or a failure in your own kind of beliefs or philosophy of, of anything? And could you describe how that might how that might be or how that could have ever affected you? Okay, so uh, that's a great question, a great pair of questions. We're often asked if we prefer busting things or making them or proving them, and I mean we're really agnostic when it comes to that. We don't we don't have a we don't care whether we're going to bust it or or make it or prove it. Um, we have been wrong, we're wrong all the time about what our intuition is, about what's going to happen. Um, we've had, we've got one coming up called Dirty versus Clean Car where the result absolutely knocked our fracking socks off and it's going to be hilarious and it's going to be, I think, kind of controversial. Um, that being said, we did an episode years ago called uh, Killer Cable Snap which is something every fisherman in the world believes is the case, which is if you stress a, a, a braided cable to its breaking point, as it breaks, it'll whip around and slice you in half, like right out of ghost ship or something like that. And like I said, there's not a fisherman in the world who doesn't know that this is true, that it's happened to people who've had their legs cut off and all sorts of stuff. And so we set up a beautiful experimental process that Jamie designed of uh, figuring out how to get cables to snap and whip in a specific direction by wrapping them around a bollard, which we had bolted down to this floor in this abandoned building on a naval base. Um, we took uh, varying cables from a quarter inch up to three quarter inch up to 80% of their breaking strength and we're cutting them with a pneumatic cutter. They were whipping perfectly. We had a bunch of dead pigs in the line of fire and we absolutely believed when we started out that experiment that morning that we would have sliced ham for lunch that <laughs> we would be watching beautiful high-speed shots of this cable whipping through I really believe that was the case and after the fourth pig that we merely dented and did not break the skin on I thought through our process and I thought our process is good I'm sure our process is good 80% of its breaking you can't ask for much more than 90% we're really right there and we should be seeing something that approximates the slicing of flesh. And I called up our head researcher on it, uh, Linda Wolkovich, uh, and said, do we have any first person accounts of people getting sliced in half by a whipping cable? And I'm eliminating aircraft carriers because those cables that launch the planes are like I-beams. They're not whipping at all. They're moving and they're heavy and they're big and they will kill you, but not in the way that this myth posits. And she went back and she said, we have one doctor, but he treated someone after it had happened. It was probably a cable that pulled him up against a pylon on a dock or something like that. Again, that'll cut your legs off, but it's not a whipping cable. And we finished that day busting that myth. And I don't consider it a shortcoming that we were totally wrong. I consider it thrilling. Again, it's the shape of one's intuition. And uh, the process of figuring out how something is going to work is a process of realizing that you were wrong most of the time. And I think that's actually, for my money, we didn't set out to make a show that was et scientifically educational. Uh, and if we had, we would have failed. But what I think we do give to people in terms of their understanding of how science works is we show how messy it is. I think that's really important that people understand. It's not people in white lab coats going, my, my experiment was a success. That it's, my experiment yielded data. <laughs> And I, so we, we don't mind at all when we're wrong. And we've got four minutes left, so. I have a very simple question. Hey, Adam. Howdy. Got a very simple question. Now that you've uh, gotten in touch with this community. A little louder. Again, now that you've gotten in touch with this community, this community obviously loves the show. Does that mean we'll see more computer-related myths on Mythbusters? You know, <laughs> That they're a tough sell for discovery. Yes, no. Actually, in the very first season, we wanted to buy two computers and sign them both, do the same exact things with both of them, sign them onto internet accounts, and yet one, we would click don't send me spam buttons and see what happened. Um, and they're, they're a tough sell. Really, for the most part, we're, we're allowed to do what we kind of want to do, but uh, 
Discovery draws the line on stuff they feel is going to be visually completely unwatchable, and so we're still trying to sell the stuff like that. But yes, no, the brain trust that I, I'm seeing here, I'm hoping absolutely for more computer-related mints. Okay, okay. Well, it's, it's time for you to move along, sir. No, but, but there's more to come. Can I say thank you? Is it time? Of course. DEFCON, thank you so much for having me here. It's my honor to come talk to you guys. You're a terrific audience. I bow to you.